The Dice Tower, Episode 569, Kicking It with Samurais. The Dice Tower is made possible by listeners like you. Thank you for your support. This episode is sponsored by USAopoly. Share laughter and make memories. Welcome to the Dice Tower, a podcast about board games and card games, and especially the people who play them. In today's show, Mandy and I talk about some Kickstarters, look beyond the new hotness, and look into the mailbag for a quick Q&A. I'm Suzanne Sheldon. And I'm Mandy Hutchinson. We're back. It's weeks after Gen Con, but this is the first episode <laughs> we're recording since Gen Con. It's lovely to talk to you again, Mandy. And you too. I, I feel like Gen Con was so far away. Right. It seems like weeks. It's it's a couple of weeks ago now, but uh, the way time works. And honestly, it was fun to hear Tom and Eric just, you know, they're digging into all their game piles. I know you've been digging into your piles of games from Gen Con too, right? Oh my goodness. It's just every Saturday. I'm like, okay, we're playing this, we're playing this, we're playing this. I'm just trying to get through all the games. <laughs> <laughs> but I definitely wanted to say thank you to everybody who came by the booth at Gen Con. It was, for my first Gen Con, it was quite the experience. And I enjoyed it. I was mildly overwhelmed by it. But without a doubt, the best thing was just being in the booth and getting to meet people. There was a constant stream of people to the Dice Tower booth. And it was just incredibly gratifying and heartwarming to meet people who listen to the podcast or watch our video content. So if you stopped by and we got to say hi to you, thank you so much. That was just incredibly awesome. Also, Mandy, we got pins, enamel pins of our dice guys there, which were just too cute. I was so excited. I thought that was great. So many people were coming. They're like, where are the pins? I'm like, oh, that was so nice. So that was really fun to see come to life. I don't know. I thought they did a great job, actually. Was How did this, any big differences for you between this di- this Gen Con and the previous one you've been to? Uh, usually when I go to Gen Con, I'm circulating a lot on the floor and you do lots of interviews. And I found this time it was more at the booth. So I didn't really have a lot of that interaction. Uh, but I did a few things like going to the uh, Masquerade Ball that was put on with Geek and Sundry and Greater Than Games. And that was a lot of fun. Uh, but other than that, I was kind of like a golden girl. <laughs> I think we were in bed by what, 11? <laughs> oh yeah. We're not, we're not late night partiers, which <laughs> makes us good roommates, I think. Exactly. I have to say though, the thing I'm still looking forward to seeing out of Gen Con, I did stumble right when I flew in, you were already there. And I stumbled in on a recording session you were doing with Chaz Marler. And I caught probably the last 10 or so minutes of what you're recording. And I I was impressed and incredibly moved by what I was hearing. And so maybe you could tell people a little bit what I'm, do you know what I'm talking about, Mandy? Yes. No, I remember. So Chaz and I had been trying to get to do this for some time. So at, I think it was at a gamma or there was some kind of convention. I noticed I'm like, wow, Chaz is really organized. You know, he's on the ball. And I'm like, I love that. Like I knew exactly what was going on. I could go to him and he could just tell me exactly who was going to be up next for interview. It was fantastic. I really liked his organization uh, because for myself, I get very stressed out when things are not organized. I don't know what's happening. I like to have a plan. Can confirm. You know, exactly. And I know things change, but I at least need to know kind of what's happening. And after speaking with Chaz, some of the concerns that I have at conventions, he had very similar concerns. And conventions can be very stressful for me. And I know we were chatting and I know he had some similarities in his feelings with certain conventions and, you know, how basically, how is it going to affect you while you're there? And how are people going to take maybe some of your reactions and, you know, how you're constantly worried about being judged and little things like that. So we go into some details about that in this video. So I think people will be surprised and think that maybe I'm a different person than what they think, but <laughs> it's still me. <laughs> no, it was, uh, I, you and I have very different personalities and sure. I found things I was relating to, even though it, it isn't necessarily my dominant personality type. And I just thought you were both speaking from what I overheard from a very genuine and relatable place. And I, I think that when, when that airs, people will really get a lot out of it. So I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing the whole conversation since I only saw a little bit of it. 
Me too. There were a lot of me too moments. Me too. Me too. Me too. So, <laughs> I'm sure there were a lot of people watching it going me too. So, and that's what we want. We want it to resonate. So hopefully that gets posted soon so uh, everyone can keep an eye out for that on YouTube. Well, if you are new to the podcast, uh, this is a podcast about board games and card games and all the kinds of analog games that we know and love and sometimes app games too, I guess. <laughs> yes. And, you know, Mandy, you and I were talking just a little bit ago and we thought it would be fun. We're going to talk about games we've been playing, some of our Gen Con hauls and stuff like this. But we realized that a couple of the games we want to talk about today were Kickstarters that we had received. And we thought it would be fun to take a quick look at some of the Kickstarters that we've gotten, or maybe even mention a couple that we're looking forward to getting that we've already backed. Uh, because I know one of the games you're, you just got fairly recently, because I backed it too, and I haven't gotten my copy. Hello. <laughs> I think we got them here in Canada first, which never happens, but Fair I, enough. Le- yeah, I legitimately think that's what happened here. You deserve that. <laughs> yeah. I, I'll let you have that one. <laughs> okay. So, uh, One of the Kickstarters I received and I was very excited to get is Deja Vu, Fragments of Memory. So if you're not familiar, I think this is Asteria Games, if I'm not mistaken. And this game is beautiful. I really, the art is what captured me and I'm a sucker for good art. So I'm like, ooh, art. Oh, wait. Yeah, maybe I should read about the gameplay. (laughs) But after reading it, I also found that the gameplay uh, was very interesting. And after playing it, I noticed there were a few kind of similarities to Five Tribes, like on the main board, picking up the pieces and dropping them and picking up at the end space all the colors. Um, And then they have like objective cards where you're using these pieces to complete them. I won't go into too much detail, but so far, I really enjoyed it. And I think it plays in about an hour and a half or so, but um, I'm looking forward to playing it again because I didn't take advantage of all of the actions in the game. So sure. uh, Deja Vu Fragments of Memory is one that I'm definitely enjoying so far and looking forward to playing again. Uh, another one that came in at Bridges to Nowhere. So um, I don't know. One. I got that Do one you? too. Do you remember the publisher off the top of your head? Oh, no, I don't. I don't. Okay. We'll try and worst. locate it while I'm chatting. Yes. But uh, Bridges to Nowhere, uh, I think it can be two player, but there's also a one to four version. I have the deluxe that I backed and it's basically a card drafting game and you're trying to build build your bridge. Mm-hmm. Takes, I think it's over a few rounds, but you're trying to collect the first player to get two objective cards, I believe, wins the game. It is harder than it looks. I was terrible at it my first gameplay, but guess what? Want to play it again. So really nice. Looking forward to playing that again. Enjoying it so far. We'll have to review you? that one together because I've played Bridges to no- I, I backed have. Bridges to Nowhere and I've played it um, a couple of times too and I it'll be interesting to see what we, we think of that one. Okay. Uh, yeah, a couple that... I've gotten in, but I haven't. Well, I guess I've played some of them. I got Civ, which is Ooh. also spread out. Carta Impera Victoria. It's got what really drew it is similar to you. What drew me into it originally was just the graphic design and the art style of it. it kind of had this more modern aesthetic to it that I that I tend to be drawn to. And uh, it's in stores already. So if people are interested, oh. they can take a look at it. And it looks like you can order. But I backed that on Kickstarter. And I have that. And I haven't had it hit the table yet. Mm. And then at Gen Con, we, the Dice Tower booth was right next to a shared booth. And one of the people sharing that booth uh, was Jordan Draper of Jordan Draper Games. And he does he did this series called the Tokyo Series. And it was three different games. And one is... Uh, it it's a puzzly game that uses different shaped wooden pieces that you have to fill in a space. So it's very, it's kind of like multi-layered tanagrams for lack of a better word. Okay. <laughs> uh, there's a game called Tokyo Metro that is a much heavier. It's, it's a train game essentially, but set in the Tokyo Metro system. And then another one that uses, it's a, it's based on vending machines in Tokyo <laughs> and it has the most amazing little components, these little bottles and little bottle holders. And it's got an actual plastic vending machine piece. And there's just dozens of games that you play with just a few components to come in this box. And I, I, I backed it and Jordan was kind enough to hand me my copies at Gen Con since we were right next to you. So that one looks really good as well. Um, And then I don't know if you backed this one, but Mars Open? No, I didn't back this one. This is a dexterity game about playing (laughs) miniature golf on Mars. Exactly. I know I'm losing you. Dexterity, so I'm like, yeah, I'm out. No. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and going, it's a going. flicking game, no less, oh, which I know how no. much you hate flicking games generally. <laughs> but I couldn't help myself because it's got these little paper shapes that you flick and you're you're trying to get the box itself kind of forms the goal. And you get these little 
obstacle, cardboard obstacles. And it's just Celine fun. And it's everything is very pink on it. And it just was quirky. I had to get it. You know, I have kids and I'll play it with them. And, and right. so, yeah, I got all those in hand and I'm really excited to try all that. Oh, my goodness. You have a lot more. I feel like I had so much to talk about, but you have some a very vast variety, which is enjoyable. <laughs> That's one of the benefits of Kickstarter, right? Is there's there's great diversity of games being produced because of what crowdfunding enables. And just to kind of close off here, I am looking forward to them. So my hand is hovering over these Kickstarters because I'm Ooh. contemplating backing our Bargain Quest and yes. Ferenzi and Re- how do you pronounce the next one? Reiti? Reiti? I don't know. I think it's yeah. Reiti. So if um, I'm mispronouncing, I'm sure someone will let me know. But uh, that's the one by Quinted Games. But Bargain Quest, this is the second uh, campaign, I believe. I think they did a print already of this yeah, one. I did a print run. Yeah. Totally sold out of it. Like, oh my goodness. no copies anywhere. And so, of course, there's so much demand for it. That's um, by Jonathan Ying. Yes, who I and met. We met at, well, I met at Gen Con, I believe. Oh, yeah. yeah. Nice guy. Very and, nice. You know, designer, for people who don't know who Jonathan Ying is, that's the designer of Star Wars Imperial Assault. So, Jonathan worked for Fantasy Flight for a number of years and was behind a number of products there that are really well known and popular. But just because of the way sometimes these things work, you, the name recognition might not be there quite yet, but... Great designer. And it's so fun to see Bargain Quest because it's also the art on Bargain Quest is done by Jonathan's sister. Which is fantastic. Victoria, yeah. which is, I love the family connection, but you're like, oh, great nepotism or whatever. Oh, no, 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 no. This family is disgustingly full of talent. It makes me mad and envious because Victoria is literally a Disney artist. Yeah, that so got me so excited. Talking, the, you know, the siblings are doing this. We got this fabulous game designer, this fabulous artist. So... I backed the original Bargain Quest. Um, so, I mean, I don't know, Mandy. That's a, you've got good taste. Uh, it's hovering, okay? It's it's hovering, almost going to click on it, but I got to <laughs> revisit the bank account there, you know, because those American dollars, they can uh, throw you for a loop. Brutal. <laughs> and and I will say Forenze is one of my top 50 games. If you watch my top 50 game Stop series, Forenze is in there. Stop it. All right. Well, I am really looking forward to... Getting some Kickstarters because honestly, I'm they're rolling right on Kickstarter right now. People mm-hmm. are finding this avenue, and so I've got Fleet Dice and Ooh, On Tour. It. Did you back On Tour? I backed Fleet Dice. Okay, Fleet Dice is heavier. It's really meaty. I'm it's excited. Delicious. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, Kickstarter. I know people have different opinions about crowdfunding and Kickstarter and games and whether it's a pre-order system and some of the shenanigans that happen in the crowdfunding world, but I'll tell you, I think cool things can be enabled by the platform of crowdfunding for board games. And I'm really excited. There's so much good stuff. I know. It's amazing. Well, Mandy, you're going to be coming up. I know that you and Eric are going to be doing an episode in a few episodes together because you're going to be at Grand Con together, right? We are. So Eric and I will be at Grand Con, which takes place 14th to the 16th of September. So... I'm telling you right now, I am there to play all the games. Come find me. Let's play a game. The heavier, the better. But I am open to all games. I know Eric is there. He's going to be excited to play some games. We're going to be doing a podcast together. And Suzanne, all the puns may have to occur. But maybe (laughs) we also got to throw in some curling references, too. I don't know. When I get with Eric, we just I can't help myself. (laughs) It's. It'll be delightful, I am sure. And I will just have to mentally block out the puns that, <laughs> that emerge. Oh. It's okay. We'll, we'll make them. No, never mind. There'll just be a lot of puns. <laughs> just leave it at that. Well, Mandy, at, and I think in our last episode that we recorded together, you were talking about Thunderstone Quest. So have you had a chance to continue that campaign or start in that campaign? Or have you not managed to get to that yet? Oh, Absolutely. We definitely started with the first game. So you want to jump into the Thunderstone Quest recap? I want to hear all about it. All right, so we're going to kick off games played with, well, we have to make it all about me, right? Ha, just kidding. (laughs) Thunderstone Quest recap. 
So on the, I think it was the last podcast, I talked about Thunderstone Quest and how we had played the kind of learner game and we were going to jump into the campaign uh, mode. So we did start it. So what we're going to do for the next, uh, you know, a few episodes while I'm playing the campaign, I'm going to kind of give you a little blurb and tell you how our campaign's going. So for those of you who are like, oh, Thunderstone Quest, man, well, then you could just fast forward. <laughs> but for those who are actually interested, I'll try and make it quick, but give you an idea how the campaign is going. So the first game of the campaign was very similar to our kind of learner game. So it was very much like that initial game. Some new things that were added to the campaign are uh, side quests, which is like a secondary objective, which is giving you goals, rewarding you with VP or legendary cards, which are awesome. Legendary cards give you kind of better bonuses, but sometimes it's so good, but they have a negative effect if you don't meet the requirements on the card. It's kind of hard to explain without seeing it. They're really, really powerful, really, really good, but they can sometimes have a kickback depending on the type of legendary card, like negative points at the end of the game. Mm. Uh, Then we also played with guild sponsorship. So after choosing your side quest, you get to choose a guild sponsorship and they favor one of the classes. So like elf, human, uh, you know, uh, What's the word I'm looking for? Not wizard, but in the magical realm there. Um, And these are next to your player board. And it's a constant bonus that you uh, obtain throughout the game. So it's another way to kind of get some little treats throughout. Uh, There's no maximum, um, uh, minimum or maximum of games in the campaign mode. And you're going to calculate your combined scores of all the games at the end of the campaign to determine the winner. So we've just started, but that's just to give you an idea of how that's going to work. And at the end of each campaign, which is kind of cool, you get an item card for free from the marketplace that you will permanently add to your base deck for the rest of the games in the campaign. So you're going to do this at the end of every game. Here's the trick, though. You cannot pick a card that another player has chosen from the market. So you got to mix it up a little bit. So at the end of that game, that's kind of cool. Yeah, I actually really like that. So you're not kind of going through the same strategy. So I like the fact that you just maybe going to a different route or with different cards. So That's where we're at. We did add the quest because we didn't do that in the first time. I liked where it was going. I tended to forget to look at them. So like, oh, yeah, I would have got a legendary card here. Oops. So I have to just remind myself to do that. So not a lot to report yet because it's the first uh, playthrough of the campaign mode. But I'm looking forward to the second one and I'll give you an update from there. So there you go. That's my Thunderstone quest recap. I, you're real. Am I selling it? Am I selling it? Yeah, you're I'm I'm intrigued. I'm looking forward to it. (laughs) All right. Well, why don't you tell I, me what you've played? I, I, I haven't been doing a campaign. <laughs> now I'm kind of envious. Um, I played a game called Lowlands. And this is a game that kind of got some attention because it features a sheep incredibly prominently <laughs> on the cover in a very dramatic pose. It looks like a romance <laughs> cover, but with sheep. I don't know. It's it's funny. You'll have to take a look. This huge sheep just staring directly into your soul. It's like, come play uh, this game. Uh, if you want to play Lowlands, save me. Yeah. Uh, this is a Z-Man publication in the States. Uh, it's a Fjordland spiel. And I think it's got a few other pub- publishers too. It's designed by Claudia and Ryan. Uh, Partenheimer and the artist is Andrea Bokoff and I think it retails for about 60 US dollars and ultimately this is a very traditional Euro style game it plays two to four it's action selection it's not really worker placement because there's not really com- competition for spots. So you have a player board and there's a four or five different actions on it. And you have three farmers that have different strengths, two, three, or four that you can use to take actions. And, you know, if you take a resource action with a four, you get four resource cards. Hmm. Ta-da! Mm-hmm. That simple. Ultimately, thematically, what you're trying to do is a couple of things. Obviously, you want to get lots of sheep. The game's all about sheep. There's tons of sheep meeples in here. Your personal board has those actions, but it also has a grid on it that looks like a field, very much like a lot of other farm-based Euro-style games. And the twist on this one is there is a flood coming, Mm -hmm. and you're trying to build up a dike to protect the fields from flooding. And to build up that dike, you contribute to, you contribute resources to this, this path, clay or stone or wood, and you have to do all the clay, and then you can move on to stone and then, or what have you. But you have to do all, you have to totally fill it with one resource first, and that may take you a f- few turns. And then you get to put this big chunky wooden piece down. And there's a little bit of variability in in the there's actual wave cards, and you never know how strong the wave is for all these little wave pieces to come out. 
And you have to work cooperatively in a way to build up that dike because the way that the waves are going to come, if you're all, if multiple people aren't contributing to building up the dike, you're all going to get flooded. So you're, there is motivation to, to contribute to that. Meanwhile, you're buying buildings to enhance your farm that have different abilities. Uh, oh, you know, a nice variety of mm. whether it's end game points or some kind of coin bonus or whatever. And you have fence pieces and you're building little pastures. You're building in little fenced areas where your sheep can live and breed and, and multiplying things like that. And that's the game. It plays in three rounds. It's very clean, uh, very relatively easy to, to pick up on a little. I don't know. I, I, I will. I will just say it was a fine game. Mm. Oh, you're I using have, my word. I, yeah. In full transparency, I've only played this game once. And it's not ideal for me to talk about a game when I've only played it once. But I'll be really honest with you. I have no desire to explore this game any further. Ooh. It's not that I did not enjoy it. It was a fine game. It's just it didn't grab me. There was just no individual piece felt compelling to me. I've played games in which I enjoyed the farm pasture building element better. I've played games in which I enjoyed the building tile element better. Uh, I've played action selection games that I've enjoyed better. I've played farming theme games that I've enjoyed better. The twist with the dike, I think I get what they were going for. But what I will say, as a lot of you all out there know, I don't typically really love cooperative games. And maybe I also don't like semi-cooperative games mm. where whether you contribute to this dike or not and how that track, I just, I didn't like that part of it. And I think that that was the hook in the game and I didn't enjoy the hook. So ultimately the game just didn't feel like it came together for me. Mm -hmm. If somebody throws low lands on the table and it's like, hey, Suze, you want to play low lands? Sure, I'll play it. It was a <laughs> fine game. Right. It just... Ah, uh, I'm I'm I bought it and I'm gonna trade it. I just have wow. no desire to dig into it any further. Uh, I wanted to like it more. Okay, but it it ultimately it was a fine kind of middle of the path Euro style farming sheep game for me. So this makes me sad because this was on my list of ooh I need to get this game and. Like, is it, are we falling into like a Caverna? Are we falling into like an Okanagan? I don't know if you've played this at all. I've played Okanagan, yeah. Like I'm trying to, or there was a game, I think. Oh, it's way I, lighter than Caverna. It's it's weight-wise, sure. It's more in, in Okanagan. It's not a heavy ah, game at all. Okay. Um, And I'm, I think Okanagan is a fine game too. And see, and that's how I felt about Okanagan, which I'm sure we'll talk about on the show, but I also in that camp, it was fine. Yeah, Okanagan was fine. I would prefer to play Okanagan over Lowlands. Oh, really? And they're different style games. But yeah, if I had to choose between the two, I'd rather play Okanagan. Wow. Okay, because for me, Okanagan was, eh, I could. Yeah, it was a fine game. Yeah. I like, yeah, it was fine. Yeah. Oh, I'm trading mine. <laughs> this makes me sad. Okay, good to know. Yeah, they can't all be 100% hits. Okay. So that was Low Lowlands? No, sorry. That was Lowlands. Low Lowlands. Yeah, that makes me pronouncing it properly. I, I wanted to like it better. Yeah. Okay. Is that the full title of the game or was it ever called something else or was it always, has it always been Lowlands? I've only ever seen it as Lowlands. Okay. I just want to make sure that I'm saying it correctly. Okay. No, that's good. Oh, I'm, I'm a little sad. Okay. Uh, moving on. So the game, one of the games that I played recently, a few times, actually, I was surprised and I'll tell you why. Magical Treehouse. And it is also known as Village of Familiar. So I actually didn't know that. Designed by Hiroki Kasawa. Artist is Matt Paquette and Tansen and Company. Publishers are One Draw, Big in Japan, and Alderac Entertainment Group, otherwise known as AEG. It retails for so about Big in Japan is AEG. It is AEG. Okay. I wasn't yeah. sure because they had two yep. on the box. It has them as two separate yep, it's things. Their, it's their, yeah. Oh, okay. It's a sub brand. Okay. See, I'm learning. I'm learning new things. So there you go. <laughs> uh, it retails for $22 Canadian, but it's uh, on a pre-order, so you can get it a pre-order, and I think it's coming in September, and it's $25 US, and I believe it is available now in the US, if I'm not mistaken. So in this game, it's a real-time and card-drafting game, and before you go, oh, Mandy, real-time, let's talk about it. <laughs> it's uh, three to four players, and it plays in about 30 to 60 minutes. So in the game, you are a new wizard, and, well, you need a fancy new treehouse. That's 
legitimately the gist of it. (laughs) So the game takes place over four rounds and each round is divided into three steps and they have to be played in order. So when you're setting up the board area, I kind of have to give you a visual a little bit to understand it, but you have a kind of separate area that you put together uh, where you're going to have your familiars moving on to get resources. Then you have a board that kind of tracks around and it's biscuits that are eventually going to go on a plate. I know it sounds a bit odd. Uh, you have a track that keeps uh, keeps track of the player turn order. And then you have a player board where you have cards and stuff that you're going to be um, putting in the garbage pile or using a planning area underneath for cards are going to keep. And then you have, I can't remember the name off the top of my head, but you have these uh, carriages, I believe they are on the right and left of you. And that's where you're passing cards to other players. So that just gives you an idea of how the setup looks like. Mm-hmm. So the three steps in the game, the first is a preparation step, and this is where you shuffle and organize the cards. So basically you're setting up where each player is going to have eight cards, and then you have a, a deck that's going to be on your board. Then you have the planning step. And this is a little, when you look at the rule book, you're like, there's so much. But depending on if you have cards in your hand or not will depend on which of the steps you can take. So you have uh, placing a planning card in your uh, planning area. So these are cards that are going to be built into your treehouse in the building building stage. You can trash your hand because maybe you want to try and get other cards or you can cast a spell, which are generally good for you, not so good for other players, that sort of thing. If you don't have cards in your hand, you can take cards from the carriage, which is cards passed to you from other players if they're there because <laughs> they may not have mm-hmm. put cards there for you. You can draw mm-hmm. cards from your deck or you can say, hey, I'm done and drop out of the planning step. And then finally, the building step. And this is where you're building the cards that you had placed in your planning area. The cards you're putting in in the treehouse, uh, they have, I think it's five colors, like purple, orange, red, and so forth. And they number in one through six. All these cards have powers in them. So when you put them into the treehouse and build them in in the specific color of the treehouse, they get stronger, but you get those abilities for the entire game. And I mean, it depends if you're making potions, you're connecting them to other uh, parts of your treehouse to kind of work off of each other. Um, but as you get to the higher numbers, there are less of those cards. I think when you get to the highest number, there's one of that card. So you could be fighting with somebody else for the same tree line. And well, you may not get to that top number because you only get points on the topmost card that's showing in that tree, mm-hmm. in that line of your tree house. So that can be something you have to look out for. Um, I've housed cards thinking I could build them only to find out, oh, there it is. Somebody's built it. And I just wasted the entire game trying to build this line of my tree house. Shucks. So the game ends after four rounds and then you gain VPs from the buildings, objective tokens and biscuits. Cause uh, when you're done in a round, you want to grab a biscuit before somebody else does player with the most points wins. So that's the general gist of it. I know that's a lot to take in, but I tried to keep it a short summary. Mm -hmm. The first time we looked at the box, I said, okay, these are some things that I kind of rolled my eyes at. Yes, rolled my eyes at. Three to four players. I have issues with games that started three players. Difficult for me to get to the table. I don't know what my problem is. Uh, And then real time. Oh, Yeah, I I have to admit, I'm surprised that you tackle uh, you're not a real-time person oh not at usually. all like not at all and i play generally my friends will play anything but a lot of us kind of gravitate toward euro worker placement type games but we're willing to try it all so we all kind of went oh real time oh and literally made that noise but i said come on i gotta try it let's let's play it so they have a mechanic in the game where you can um, or a way of playing the game where it's not real time. So the moves, it's like you do an action, you stop, then do another action, you stop. Oh, it was terrible. It was so bad where we literally did one round like that and we went, okay, let's do it in real time. It was that bad. And interesting. Okay. I, I spoke to AG and they said to me, it was something they put in there. So people had an option, but it is really meant to be played real time. And honestly, I can see why we liked it so much better in real time. So much better. And it didn't feel like, okay. you know, those real-time games where you were like, oh, I'm super rushed. It it didn't really feel overly rushed because you still had time to make your decisions. Yeah, if you were f- the fastest to get out first, you grabbed a biscuit. And, you know, you need so many of those to get a point at the end of the game. Not a huge deal, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. So the real-time actually worked in this game. The rule book I found was easy enough to understand. The spell cards are not very intuitive. I found when you were just looking at them, you're like, I don't really know what that means. So you needed to look at the book because there's no player aid. You needed to look at the book to figure out what the spell is. And now you're taking time to go through and read that. You know what I mean? So it's taking away from you playing quickly. Mm -hmm. Uh, I did like the fact that the cards got less and less as you got to the higher numbers because it really pushed you to kind of 
diversify and not focus too much on one thing because you could legitimately, you know, say, oh, great, I focused on this and someone else worked on it. I'm not getting these points. So I like the fact that there were a variety of things to choose from. That's always a great thing for me. I love option in a game. Uh, So overall, we actually really liked it. Huh. When it gets to the table more than three times, then my group, yeah, you can safely say they enjoy it. And for us, this was a surprise. So that uh, was Magical Treehouse. I, I I really liked it. I, I have to say I am surprised on a number of levels that you enjoyed this so much, which I think makes me more interested to try it. The fact that it definitely falls out. Of, and, you know, we can joke about you and your space games, but I think <laughs> everybody who's been listening to this show for a little bit knows we're moving beyond Space games, right? Yeah, I mean, you love space games. You can just say it now. But I actually played Paradox this weekend, which see, is a space game. <laughs> <laughs> but for real time, definitely not your typical thing. So the fact that you enjoyed it so much, I'm, I'm, I'm interested. I'm interested in a real time yeah. game that captures you that way. That's cool. Yeah, definitely enjoyed it. Well, I don't have a real time game, but after <laughs> kind of not being so excited about Lowlands, which wasn't a bad game. It just you know, wasn't a great one to me. I want to talk about a game I really liked, and this is Palm Island. And this is a solo game primarily. It's mm. designed by John Metlin, and it's published by, uh, I think John is a partner in this, this publishing house called Portal Dragon. This is a Kickstarter, as we were talking about at the top of the show. This is a Kickstarter that I backed and, and got delivered. And so I don't know what it's going to retail for i pledged 16 bucks and uh i think it was 16 bucks well spent this is what could be considered i guess a micro game it you only use 17 cards to play it and these are quote unquote four sided cards Hmm. because each of the actual sides of the cards you know cards are two-sided has a top and a bottom. And depending on which way they're oriented or rotated, that's that's what you're dealing with at a given time. And the other twist, the, per, the reason why it's called Palm Island, is you don't need a tabletop surface. You can just hold it in your hand. And in point of fact, you need to hold it in your hand. The way that the cards work, it would be inconvenient to have it laid flat. You need to hold it in your hand. And I, I find solo, hold it in your hand. I find all this very intriguing. And... I I suppose there's a theme, there's a setting, it's a tropical setting, but basically you're working, cards have resources on them and actions on them to flip them or to rotate them. And you're trying to, but that takes resources to take those actions. So you're trying to turn cards perpendicular, so sideways, and then Uh the resource part is sticking out. And then you have that resource available. So when it comes to the front, you say, oh, I'm going to turn this and get some fish. Great. And then it moves to the back of the stack, still turned sideways. And then the next card comes up and it's... Uh, oh, you need two wood and a fish to rotate this card. Well, I don't have that. So then I discard it to the back and move on. You actually have access to the two top cards, not just the front one. So you have some decisions and some choices to make there. And so you're rotating cards until you get the resources you need. Then, oh, I get to flip this one for a stronger action or a bigger resource. Or eventually some of the cards have point values on them. You play through eight rounds. There's a little timer card stuck in there and you rotate it to the two and then to the three and then to the four and then do it again that times you. And you go through the deck eight times, which goes very, very quickly because again, it's only 17 cards. And then you just count the number of points that you are, you manage to get to the top of the cards as through all this rotating and flipping. It's mechanically very, very simple. And I'm not going to call it a deep game. It once I've played it a bunch because I just I literally have the box next to my bed. And before I go to bed, I just grab the deck and I just start fiddling with it for 10 minutes and wind down and I'm done. So I've been playing it a bunch. It's not deep or complex, but it is satisfying. It ultimately feels puzzly, especially as you get to know the cards because you are shuffling them. So the set of the cards, the cards don't change, but they do get randomized. And so dealing and making efficient decisions changes from game to game. And that, that adds enough. Also there's, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it a campaign element. There's also some extra cards. There's feet cards that if you qualify, if you get to a certain point level, you can add this card to your deck for your next play for solo play. And so that kind of adds another element to the solo play as well. On top of that, there is a cooperative and a competitive mode. The cooperative mode has you working together 
uh, because the set I, I backed, I got two decks worth, a red oh, deck okay. and a blue deck, but they're the same decks. Uh, you work together to combat disaster cards that are laid out. And so you have to have a certain resource set to, to beat. Co- and I haven't played competitive mode. Apparently, there you, you know, there's you want more points and be more efficient than your opponent or, or what have you. And I think there's some extra cards in there that uh, add another element to the competitive mode as well. But basically, Palm Island, it's a solo game. It plays in your hand. It's resource turning. It's mechanically very smooth. I have the plastic card version. My, this is very personal. The plastic cards are slippery. Ooh. So they're very durable. I could play this in the bathtub or something <laughs> or at the beach. But because they're slippery, I've a couple of times I've kind of dropped a couple of the cards. They've slipped out of my hands. And that's bad because the order of the cards really matters in this right. game. But that's such a nitpick, honestly. That hasn't stopped me from enjoying it. It's a great quick little thing. It's 18 cards. Shove it in your pocket. Shove it in your handbag if you've got a handbag or a backpack. And you always have a little analog game to entertain you wherever you are. I think it's a I think it's a real winner. And that is Palm Island. So I'm not a solo game player, but lately I've been these kind of uh, micro games or pocket games are appealing to me because mm-hmm. on occasion, you know what I mean? If I'm at work and I just, you know, want a quick little break, these are great to kind of pull out. So in that sense, I like them. How does this compare to a, um, what's that one? A Friedman Freeze game. It's a finished Finished, I think that's what it is. Yeah, I haven't played Finished, but oh, I you know haven't. what you're talking about. Oh, I mean, okay, obviously, much slimmer. Of course. Or or like a Maiden's Quest, which is something we will talk about on the show. Probably yeah, I got in the a next... copy, and I'm so excited. I haven't had a chance to play it yet. The rules. You haven't played that one either? Oh, okay. Yeah, it's bogging me down just a little bit. And, okay, so you know what? Let's asterisk this, asterisk this for next time so we can bring it up when we talk about um, the other solo games that I've mentioned that you haven't played. I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's, oh, oh, Freeman Freeze Friday. Friday. I, you're talking about Friday, the solo game Friday? No, is that finish, what finished. Is it finished? Freeze? Okay. Finished? I'm pretty sure it is. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, it could be right. Stronghold games. Uh, yeah, it's a solo one. I mean, I think it's not probably not as small as this game. I think this would probably be closer to uh, uh, Maiden's Quest. Like I said, we haven't talked about it yet, but I've played it. I know you're going to play it. We'll talk about it on a podcast. You know what? So let's star this. Asterisk star. Pause. Asterisk. And then bring it up. Oh, this might even lead to a nice pocket game solo list of some sort and don't call it a top 10 because it's not <laughs> I, I i could between button shy's wallet games and some of the other micro games out there including things like love letter that are now classics right we could do something like that okay but a, a nice listing right okay i like that a, a grouping of sorts a grouping of sorts okay <laughs> All right, now that I've totally hijacked your game, I'm going to talk about another game that I played, Starship Samurai. So this Ah. is designed by Isaac Vega, and the artist is Gunship Revolution, and it's published by Plaid Hat Games. It retails for about 63 Canadian, and it's about 51 US, and I believe it is available now. It's a set collection area control type game with a little bit of take that. It's uh, two to four players and it plays in about 75 minutes. But for the first game, it does play longer, especially with a higher player count. So the objective is to win the game by having the most honor or victory points by the end of the game. You're going to gain this honor by battling for control of locations. And they specifically call it across the Lotus Galaxy. And basically, you're trying to strengthen your alliances. So when you set up the game, again, I want to give you a little bit of context. There's a lot happening. I seem to have picked games with a lot of pieces this week. but <laughs> So you have the alliance board, and this is where you have your clan markers, and you want to kind of move these up throughout the game because this is how you're going to get points, consistently uh, get points. There are also location cards. These are going to be placed at the location set out, and these are based on player count. And these cards you want to collect for end game points because collecting sets of the different cards, they have these little um, pips on them, collecting sets of the different numbers, like a one, two, three, uh, will get you extra points at the end of the game. You have action cards, which you're going to use for um, at taking actions in the game for quick actions or battle cards used in battle only. You have unit cards, which is your samurai cards, your large ships, your carrier, and your small ship. So they give you special abilities. And then you have order tokens, which are used on your player board, which are you going to use to take your actions, such as moving your units, your samurais and ships, gaining wealth, etc. So the round has three phases that you complete in order. You have the player turn phase, and this is where you're using your tokens and your cards and your free orders on your cards, basically taking your actions. Then you have the battle phase where you want to fight for locations. So... Before I even get into that, 
let's talk about the player turns. So something you're trying to do is you're trying to gain control of these locations. And by doing so, you want to place your ships out there and your samurais. I'm going to talk a little bit about how we chose the samurais later on. We chose to just randomly give them out. You're supposed to draft the cards to choose them. But first game, it's a bit easier just to do it randomly. So you're going to have two samurais that you can deploy onto these locations with ships to try and get control because then you can get the benefits every round of that location when it comes back to you if you are still in control of that location. And this includes moving up tokens on the alliance board. You want that. Then once we play your turn phase is finished, you're going to have your battle phase. And this is where if you have more than one person at a location, you're going to battle to see who's winning that location spot and basically getting the card, which is going to go towards your set collection. So this is where you want to house some battle cards in your hand. And uh, you don't know what the other players are going to play because it's a simultaneous reveal. One, two, three, flip. And you don't have to play one. But if you're looking to keep that location, get the card and rewards, you might want to do that. What I like about the battle phase, we're just going to go into resolution phase. Whoever wins the battle comes off of that location. The person who did not win the battle stays on that location for the next round. So they have something to start with going forward. So it's nice that you lose, but you don't completely lose everything. You do get to keep your ship samurai and so forth on that location. Keep in mind, some of these samurais have special abilities too. So it's really cool when you get to move them around um, coming back to your player turn phases. So the game ends when no cards are remaining in the location deck. So that's um, when we put those cards out in the locations, when we cannot refill game is over and at the end of the game you want to gain points based on sets of location cards and any points you would have gained throughout the round most points wins so that's a very very basic summary of the game there's a few more things that are happening but just to give you an idea so yes it is space themed and yes (laughs) i enjoyed it (laughs) and i played with i played it three times i played with two player and four players Okay. It does play differently with two. With two, you just don't have that competition. I lost so brutally. It was horrible because I ignored that alliance board. And this is where basically having on your track on the alliance board, having these chits at certain levels, you could be getting 10, 15, 20 points around if you continually have these chits on your line of the alliance board. You're as your competitors, you want to move them over to your line. So you're getting points and not giving it to your competitors. I -hmm. did not pay enough attention to that in the first game and I paid for it dearly. So with four players, it definitely gets a bit more competitive. There's a lot more damaging of ships because space is limited, right? You want to have majority, but you want to destroy your competitor ships. Mm -hmm. So um, it does play differently at two and four. There's a slight variant for two players. Um, I do find that the Samurais, we prefer to assign them randomly. There's a couple where they have like a strength of six, which is high because the other ones range between two and four. Okay. So that's high. And if you combine that with another, there's like a four. That's really hard to beat. Now, do I think it was in balance? No, but I definitely think that's one to kind of watch out for. And in a two player game, I found it more apparent than in a four player game. So, like I said, it could have been just the way we were playing or that I was playing, but I did find it more noticeable versus in a four-player game. I think it balanced out a little bit better. Um, okay. Again, there is a variant, though, for this, uh, the two-player, so it's something you can try versus uh, what's the original two-player. But, yeah, we just assigned the uh, Samurais randomly versus a draft. I find it's easier in the first game. There's a lot of reading on the cards, which is normal for this type of game. So the first game can take a bit longer to go through because people are still trying to figure out their powers and seeing how they're working together. So there's a lot more reading. So prepare to add, you know, 30 minutes or so to a game because you're just becoming acquainted. There's a bit more reading. But it it speeds up as you get to know the cards. It does. This is not a game for someone, however, who has AP. Okay. And I say that because it's like, well, this card's so good. Or, oh, well, I could really use this card. Like, you're trying to play out the multiple scenarios in your head of battle or, you know, playing actions. And it could actually really lengthen the game. You can, in advance, kind of think of what you want to do and then react to situations. But if you're that type of player that really has to plan everything out, this might be a problem for you. Because you can be affected by multiple players. Right? So it's one of those things you got to be able to think on the fly as well. Uh, So I mentioned before, the person who doesn't win the battle, I like the fact that after the battle, their tokens, their units, their their samurai, their ships stay on the board versus the the new player. They get the rewards. Basically, they take their stuff. See you later. And they're off the board. (laughs) They basically like I win by I crushed you and they leave. So but I like the fact that it gives the person who didn't win an opportunity to kind of catch up or get some points. Sure. For the next round. 
Um, wealth, I like the fact that you can use wealth as a booster. You can use wealth to boost the number of actions. Like those tokens I told you use for actions, they're numbered one through four. So if you put a one on wealth, it just means you get one wealth. If I put a two on movement, it means I get to deploy two ships to a location or two movement. When you add the wealth, I like the fact you can boost it. So if I add five wealth to a one chit, it now turns into a six. It also gives me more uh, strength on ships so I can put it under ships. And now, oh, look at that. Under certain ships, I get, you know, an additional I had a strength of one. Now it's a strength of four because I added three wealth underneath it. So that's your money tokens, things like that. But I cannot stress enough. The alliance board is huge. It's points every round. <laughs> <laughs> Just trust that. Strategery. So, yeah. So overall, I really liked it. I definitely think at four players for the first game, it is runs a bit long, but it's new, right? And everyone's trying to figure it out. Uh, you cannot ignore certain parts of the game. If you just decide to completely ignore things, you will suffer and you will feel it. You have to um, do a little bit of everything. Right. And there is a bit of take that, but it it doesn't feel like you're being targeted or made. It's just part of the game. Which is also something that sometimes doesn't appeal to you, right? A really aggressive right. uh, or area control kind of thing is not typically something that you, you're you drawn to. No, it isn't. And I, I'm purposely picking these types of games to kind of say, hey, try them. And, you know, you could change your mind. I do feel if you have a, a samurai with the higher uh, value, strength value, yeah, you might, people might kind of come after you to knock you down a few pegs, but it balances out. So <laughs> overall, I, I enjoyed it. I actually look forward to playing it again. What, what did you think? I, I So I've got a copy of it, but I haven't had a chance to play it yet. Uh-huh. I just like the look of it. It looks really, really cool. The minis are cool. Um, even though one of mine, its little haunt hand broke off. And oh, I me guess, too. So, it was- so I guess, so I've heard from two other people online that apparently the figure that has, it, it just breaks off at the wrist. It's pretty common. I'm not worried about it. I'll just yeah. glue it back on. But Oh, mine's not even in the box. Like, it's just not there. Oh, <laughs> Okay, I, I didn't even notice until my friend pointed it out. Oh, wow. Interesting. Oh, well, it sounds like they might have a weak point on a mini there. But I yeah. think the minis look super cool. And I just like the color palette of the whole thing. It looks, it just looks cool. Yes. Yeah. Oh, and I almost forgot to mention the most important thing. On the miniatures, when you have a lot of them on the board, it's hard to differentiate whose is you know, like, okay, let me look at the picture. Yeah, this they're is all yours. Gray. They're not painted. Right, they're not painted. And let's be honest, I don't really have time as much as I would love to paint them. I don't have time. They're probably going to stay gray. But if they had made rings to clip on the bottom, so you know. Oh, so you know your player color. Right, attached or something I, I, like, like attach a player yeah. color. So something to consider that would make things a little bit easier. So I think overall for me, I really enjoyed it. Looking forward to trying it again. That is Starship Samurai. Well, I got new roll and write games at Gen Con and you better believe I was going to play them. <laughs> so I wanted to talk about Railroad Inc. This, uh, it's actually a duo of roll and write games from Horrible Games and Simon Games. And the design team's really great. It's the same designers behind Dragon Castle and mm-hmm. Lorenzo Silva's Dun Steam Park and Potion Explosion. So a really nice design cred history there. Uh, along with Lorenzo Silva, uh, Yalmar Hawk was uh, one of the designers as well. And each one of those two boxes, there's a, oh shoot, a deep blue deep and blue, amazing yeah. red edition. And <laughs> I believe they each retail for $20. So if you want both, it's 40 bucks. And component wise, it comes with It's got this neat magnetic flat box. It comes with six dry erase pens and it comes with six dry erase folding boards. So they're not paper pads and they're not, the boards actually have a fold and a bend in them. So you get kind of little dry erase boards for for your components and then custom dice. This is essentially, it's called Railroad Inc. The dice have rails and road icons on them. So some will just have a rail line, some will have a road and a rail intersecting or curving or what have you. There's a whole bunch of different faces and each turn, four of those dice get rolled and every player who's involved has to do all four of the dice. They can pick whatever order and put them wherever they want on the board. But this is something I like in a lot of roll and write games is when you can all play simultaneously. I just think that's great. It keeps the things clipping and uh, like games like Karuba, uh, which is not a roll and write, but where Everybody has the same thing. It's the choices you make with the things you get. I just really enjoy games like that. 
you roll these things, you have to draw the rails and the roads appropriately. And ultimately, as you're filling out your little grid on your board with rails and road lines, you want to connect these exit spots that are marked on the edges of the grid. Because at the end of the game, you're going to get points for the exits that you connect. You're going to get points for your longest single road, your longest single rail. And then there's a three by three square in the center that they kind of highlight and you'll get points for filling that in. Pretty straightforward rule set. You can teach it pretty darn quickly. Uh, On top of that, with the dice, there's also six, uh, I think six, I can't remember. There's special (laughs) moves, special faces that you can use whenever you want but you're limited. You can use each one only once and you can use a max of three. And that really, really helps in the game. It really helps build flexibility or get you out of a tight spot. And that's another small design element that they added that I think really helps the game along. Now, what's the difference between Deep Blue and Blazing Red? They're essentially the same game. And if you have both sets, you can play up to 12 players at a single time because you have all the components that you need. The difference is, some special dice that come in each because Deep Blue has two dice that are for a river's expansion and two dice that are for a lake's expansion. And Blazing Red has two dice that are the meteor's expansion and two dice that are the lava or volcano expansion. An expansion is literally just two little dice that you add to the mix, but it really, yeah. Oh, I thought it was more. Okay, because I have a copy. I just haven't played mine yet. I didn't realize that. Okay. Yeah, it's just when you want to add a quote unquote adding expansion, just take the two dice out and add them to the four plain (laughs) dice. It's that easy. (laughs) I like it. And each one of these little two dice adds a different set of rules. So rivers just adds a third line type that you have to manage. Lakes lets you draw in lakes and it can help you make bigger connections. Lava... And and so that's the blue. The the deep blue has the, the water elements and they're pretty serene. They... You just add them and they add another dimension to the game. The Blazing Red Edition is a little bit meaner or tougher in that there's destruction or limitations. It adds limitations. Mm -hmm. Um, I have not played Meteors yet. I've played all the others, but I haven't played Meteors, probably because it's a little more complex on on how they work, and I just haven't had a chance to get into it. But um, lava, you draw a volcano in the middle, and then lava just spreads, and it cuts off squares from you, and you have to kind of work around it and things like that. So it's a little... And and if you can't fill in the lava, you have to draw lava, and if you can't, you have to destroy one of your exist, pre-existing cells to, to make it fit. So that's Railroad Inc. The Deep Blue or the Blazing Red, it's a roll and write that you can play simultaneously it technically will play unlimited numbers of players. You just have to have the pieces for it. You just have to have the player boards for it because you all play with the same dice and rolls. I really, really like it. I think it's a solid entry into the roll and write world. I like these pathing ones. It will be compared to Avenue or Kokoro. I think that's fair. Um, hmm. This one's a little, I don't know. I feel like there's a little less... Plan. They both feel strategic in different ways, or they both feel like you have to plan ahead for to mitigate your bad luck in the future. I don't know how to explain it, yeah. which I should because I'm talking about games. But yeah, I, I, get I, it. I think it add, I think it, it it's a nice addition. I think at twenty dollars that plays one to six players out of the box because you can totally play it solo. Um, solid, solid entry. I'm really, really enjoying it. I will say personally, I enjoy paper pads or score sheets and roll and writes better, but that's Mm. because I laminate. I find them more portable. I haven't had any problems with my foldable boards. Arguably, they could wear out or whatever. I don't think it's a big concern. I think that's just me being futzy. I will say, though, that the dry erase pens that come in the game, they have to include them. That's just the way games work. If they didn't include dry erase pens, gamers, we would just complain. They're they're serviceable at best. Oh. But I'm I'm getting very finicky about my dry erase pens for roll and write games. Well, so. those ones that you recommended to me are fantastic. Yeah, the Stabler Lumo Color so Correctables. So good. Yeah. They are the best. So needless to say, when I pull out Railroad <laughs> Inc., I don't touch the pens that come in it. I pull out my Stabler Lumo Colors to use yeah, instead. But Those are great. It's good that they included it. At best, it's a nitpick. It's not a big deal. Sure. Uh, Railroad Inc. is a delightful roll and write game uh, that definitely will. There's there's some agonizing decisions and choices as you go in a very good way. 
Oh, okay. I am looking forward to playing this. I have both myself. I was hoping maybe, can you play in the lunch hour? Or is that going to be? Oh, easily. Easily. Okay. It's a great lunchtime game. Okay. Because that's what we'll do. I'll play them both and then play the expansions. The lava one has me uh, interested. But I think that just is stemming to childhood things and lava and stuff. (laughs) Oh, interesting. Yeah. Well, I know. It's weird. Don't step in the hot lava. Don't step in the hot lava. Yes. I need you to learn meteors to teach me how to do it. It's got this thing where a number, yeah. Where where the meteor lands and all this, uh, okay. That's when you got tackled. Teach me. Okay, so I'm gonna I'll, I'm gonna I'll do it. Play it at lunchtime and then we'll revisit. <laughs> Alrighty, enough of railroading. I am looking forward to hearing about this next game. I have not gotten to play this yet, but I am so excited. Okay. So I want to hear all about it. All right. So if you're wondering what game we're talking about, it is Samurai Jack Back to the Past. So this is designed by Andrew Wolf. Uh, there is no artist listed on BGG. Publisher is Project Raygun and USAopoly. So I have it as it's not priced in Canadian uh, dollars because I can't seem to find it on any of our sites, so it just might not be available as of yet, but it is $25 in the U.S. It plays two to five players in about 45 to 60 minutes. So it's a simultaneous action set collection card drafting game, and it's based on the animated series Samurai Jack, and the mission is to return to the era before the reign of his adversary, the evil demon Aku. So this is probably sounding familiar to those of you who have watched it. Yep, all this sounds <laughs> awesome. So in the game, it's actually pretty straightforward. You've got some cards that you're using for movement, and each player has a character they choose, and they have their own set of movement cards. And uh, there's uh, the miniatures in their game, so all the characters have their own miniatures in the character sheet. Uh, then you have a coup, you have Jack, and then you have some villain cards as well in the game. We'll talk about that how that works. And then you have a pathing of tiles that you create through every round, because this is going to be played through, I think it's... Uh, Three rounds, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, this path, you're making their different colored tiles. And the reason why this is important is because the movement cards that you're using are colored to match the tile. So it kind of determines where you want to go. So on a turn, this is generally what happens. Jack advances along the path, and you do that by flipping one of his movement cards, and he moves the, his uh, figure moves to that location uh, in the sequence. So it's based on the color and the name, and it's on the card, and it matches, so it's very straightforward. Uh, if Jack moves to a space with a player, his sanity comes back, because sanity is important, because it could cause you to lose if Jack's sanity goes too far up the track. If Jack is on a space uh, location where a coup is, he loses sanity. And if no players um, go to Jack's space, he can also lose sanity. So yeah, his sanity goes up pretty quickly if you're not keeping track of him or trying to be with him. Then the next thing is players will advance along the path. So they flip a movement card and, sorry, they choose a movement card from their hand and they choose where they want to go on the path. So obviously trying to get to Jack is a good place. Um, The reason why you want to get to certain spots is because you have a display of uh, support cards, I believe. And those are cards you need to acquire in order to beat the villain and a coup at the end of the path. Uh, Players advance along the path. They So you do that with your movement card. Then you advance a coup and he's got his own movement cards. And if you land on the same spot as a coup, that's bad. Because then guess what? You're not choosing your your movement card next turn. It's getting chosen for you. So And you don't get any support cards. I know. So terrible. (laughs) And then you resolve the character effects from where you've landed. Basically all the things I talked about. Losing sanity, getting your cards, and that sort of thing. So... Over the rounds, there's three rounds. The first round, when you get to the end, there's a villain that you can fight. You don't have to, but if you're able to, it's good because that's how you collect honor points. And you do that by using the support cards, which have little symbols like a feather or an axe. And you'll see on the villain card, it tells you the sequence of things you need in order to to beat it. So there's two of those that happen. You finish uh, the path, get to that one beat it, or if you can, and then you reset the path, do it again. And on the third round, it's actually a version of a coup that comes out on that mm-hmm. last one and it's like it's super hard it's harder than the other villains sure and again it's looking for the sequencing of support cards for you to beat it um get your honor points player with the most honor points wins cool. it's pretty straightforward so i mean it's yeah. thematic which is great so if you're i thought the miniatures were adorable and i am familiar with the the animated series and i know you are for sure so then you probably know more than i do about it and uh, the little figurines that they have in the in the the game are so cute. It's definitely really thematic. Follows the story. You will definitely be loving that aspect of it. Yes. The the rule book is an issue. 
Oh, I okay. have issues with rule books that I don't even know how what you would call that. They just fold. They don't fold out like a book, but they fold out almost like a a long stream of paper. Oh, like it's, an accordion fold? Yes, an accordion type fold. Uh huh. That'd be right. Oh my goodness, it's such a pain. It, it literally reading this rule book, it, it could have been put on like at most three pages. Like there was no need for this. I find it very uh. frustrating, and even some of the wording and the way it was laid out, it didn't need to be that complicated. It's oh, okay. not a complicated game. And I think we spent more time kind of flipping back and looking through this. And we're like, oh, my gosh, this is so frustrating. And I'm playing with people who play like TI4 and stuff. So, you know, I'm pretty sure we can handle a rule book. This irked me. And yes, I am really hard on rule books. This didn't need to be like that. So that was a problem mm-hmm. for me. The game itself, there was good gameplay there. It was just I saw where it was going. I feel like it, I don't know if it quite got there. Okay. I felt like this is the type of game that if you were familiar with the series and you loved the series. Hello. You will, yes. You will probably really like the game. Awesome. I'm familiar with the series. And for me, it was like, OK, sure. All right. OK. Do you know what I mean? I get it. It's fine. And I think maybe I was a bit frustrated with the rule book a little bit um, at that point. So we were all kind of like, OK, fine, let's play, you know, and played a couple of times. It, the game itself, the there's a game there. Mm-hmm. I just, to what extent would I play it again is where I'm at. So I think if you're a fan of the series, you will appreciate the nuances of the game. And it definitely will push you to say, hey, no, definitely I would keep this game and continue to play it. As someone who's not a fan of the game. Of I the felt, show. Oh, sorry, of the show. Excuse me. There's a game there. I just... Ugh. I just don't know if it fully got to where it was supposed to go. I don't even know how to explain that properly. Hmm. I feel like there are elements that could have been added or done a bit differently. Um, I, there was something missing for me. All right. I think that's fair. Uh, it, it sounds like a very straightforward game. It is. Very. But without a doubt, looking at it, it just, as such a big fan of the show as I am, I'm really excited to try it because it does sound thematic, especially in the newer episodes. All the pieces and art look great. And maybe for me, the theme will carry it beyond the point that you just weren't able to hurdle because you you don't have that fandom. And I think there are games like that. I, I totally think that there are games um, uh, like that. I think we've talked about Villainous before. I talked about Villainous a couple episodes ago. And that's an example where uh, the theme and the gameplay click so well together. Right. But without a doubt, being a fan of of the characters and the Disney cartoons really helps immerse you into the game overall. And so, you know, it sounds like that's just something you didn't have on this one. Yeah. So it's not a bad game. I just feel like it was, was almost there for me. But as I said before, if you are familiar with the series and you would really like it, you definitely something that you may decide you want to keep in your collection. I definitely think, I think it's a 13 plus game. uh, And I definitely, that's a good rating for this. Mm -hmm. It's very straightforward. So, it's one of those games, maybe if I played it more, I've played it a couple times. If I've played it more than that, maybe it'd grow me. But it wasn't like Harry Potter where I looked at Harry Potter and I'm like, oh, the art. But then I played it, I'm like, oh, it's it's not difficult, but I really liked it. But again, I really love Harry Potter. Yeah. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Huh? So it makes I get, a difference. I get that where that's kind of something that I'm putting into it. But I think it's definitely a game if you like a very straightforward game. Like I said, they need to change that rule book. But if you like straightforward game, you like the animated series. It's a good game. I think you will enjoy it. It just wasn't for me. Well, there you go. So that was Samurai Jack Back to the Past. <laughs> well, we've talked about a lot of new games, quite frankly. And there's more than new games out there. So maybe we should take a quick look at some older games. Sounds like a plan. Let's discuss those previously discovered board game gems in Shelf Staple. In today's Shelf Staple, I wanted to start with a game that you and I have played together, Mandy, and that is Mission Red Planet. This is a 2010 game, which, to be honest, it doesn't feel like a 2010 game for for whatever that means. That's eight years ago. It's so long. It feels like it's not long, but it's long. It, it's it's kind of that that interesting spot, but originally uh, 2010. It's got a really nice reprint that's available now from Fantasy Flight Games. It's beautiful. The designers are the Brunos, Katala and Fiduti. The art is Christophe Madura and Fantasy Flight Asmodee. That kind of chain of publication, yeah, is is there, and it retails in the states for about fifty dollars. Mm-hmm. 
thematically, this is a game set in a steampunk world where you are com- sending agents to Mars to colonize Mars and to get all the good resources that were discovered on Mars. But it's got that steampunk aesthetic that personally I find really enjoyable. Hmm. Ultimately, it's just a game of action selection. It's card-based action selection. All players have the same hand of action cards and they can they choose which one they play in their turn. And those actions are things like putting agents onto ships, uh, f- shooting ships up, moving agents around, that kind of thing. It's all about getting agents onto ships, getting those ships up to Mars, and then moving pieces around Mars. There's an area control element because there are different regions on Mars that you can go to, and those regions have the resources that you're trying to get. So when you get up there, you're 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 trying to have majority in certain areas so that you get the juicy goods. <laughs> and that's basically the whole game. You have this hand of cards. There is a card that lets you take the action of getting the cards you've played back into your hand. The timing of playing that specific action is really important in the game. And I I love that challenge of figuring out, oh, do I eke out a weaker action first and then scoop all my cards up? Or do I really have to have that one strong action that I played ages ago and get it back right now? Uh, The Fantasy Flight Edition has really great components. You have these tiny astronaut style minis. Everybody gets their own handful of these little miniatures that look like little astronauts, kind of uh, reminiscent yes. of like the old MTV commercial. I remember those. And I also remember someone knocking over my perfectly aligned astronauts. I like that. That was, <sighs> that was so I don't know who you're talking about. What? No, yeah. surely who mm. would do that to you, Mandy? Yes. <laughs> that, that sounds like a really fun person to play games with. <laughs> Destructive. But Mission Red Planet, with the action selection, the area control is very light. Some area control games feel very take that and very aggressive. I don't get that sense from Mission Red Planet personally. I just think it all snaps together very, very well. It plays a larger player count very, very well. It's a nice game to have on hand in case your group goes above five players. Uh, you can always pull out Mission Red Planet. It's quick, but it is fulfilling to play. And I'm just a huge fan of it. And I I think that uh, it deserves a place on pretty much everyone's shelf, making it a oh, <laughs> shelf staple. Womp, 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 anyway, womp, womp. Mandy, you've played. I mean, we've, <laughs> like, to your point, we've literally played this before. And I had fun playing it with you. I love it. No, it was a really great game. I actually think we did that on the cruise, but I, I actually really enjoy this. My friends who are not, I don't want to say hardcore gamers. They're just, you know, they're not regular gamers and they love this game so much. I've played it quite a bit. I'm not really into steampunk, but it works for this game. So I actually think it's a great one to have on your shelf. I still have mine. It's fantastic. <laughs> Well, the game that I'm going to talk about is one that I feel everybody's played except for me. I've only played it recently a few times, and that is Pillars of the Earth. And this was published in 2006, so it's definitely an oldie, but a goodie. As designed by Michael Rinek and Stefan Stadler. Artist is Michael Menzel, Anka Pohl, and Thilo Rick, published by Cosmos. It retails for about 53 Canadian and 43 uh, US dollars. I believe this is a, there is a second reprint that is out, and this is the copy that I have. It's two to four players, and it plays in about 90 to 120 minutes, so it is a, it's a couple hours to play. A little meatier, yeah. Yeah, it's definitely on the uh, probably medium, but the lighter end of medium, and it is a worker placement game. So in the game, players are trying to construct a a cathedral. And by doing that, that's, you know, you want to get the most victory points to win. So you have workers and you want to use these workers to produce raw materials and then using your craftsmen to convert the materials into victory points. Workers can also be used to produce gold, which you want because it is the main currency of the game. Players are given three master builders in the beginning, uh, sorry, in each turn, which you can do a variety of tasks, which is recruiting more workers, buying or selling goods, or well, just getting straight up points. You want to get early choices with the master builder and you do this by paying gold so it's a little track that runs on the bottom of the board yeah we're going to talk about that in a moment but basically Mm. if you want to get ahead and get to certain spots before other people you got to pay got to pay to play (laughs) 
And you basically have to find that balance between getting the gold and trying to find your purchasing, you know, trying to get to these spaces early to earn victory points. So I've just given a very basic synopsis of the game. If you like a worker placement, a lighter end of medium worker placement, I definitely see why people enjoy this. I was under the impression this game was so heavy, you know, like, oh, okay, well. Well, it's definitely in my alley, but I still enjoyed it. Well, and quite frankly, you're saying 90 to 120 minutes. That's That doesn't sound like a medium weight game length. That sounds like it's strained into heavier play. Yeah, so for me, I think because I play games that are generally in the three plus hour range on occasion, I definitely think it falls in. If people are familiar with Coimbra, I definitely mm-hmm. think it would be close-ish to that. Okay. I don't think it's heavier than that. So I'd say like medium, but on the lighter end of it. If you're a newer player, I, I think you could, after going through the rules and maybe after a round, you say, oh, okay, I see how that works. I really enjoyed it. I, I, I Going in, I thought it was going to be a different game. But even after I found out, oh, okay, it's this type of game, it's a worker placement, which, I mean, I love that. And I love the fact that you have a variety of spaces on the board you can go to, you have workers you can use. I mean, you have different ways to to play the game, which is always nice. My biggest folly is that I never want to spend the money. <laughs> I'm so cheap. You're I'm like, cheap. I'm so cheap. And frugal. then, well, okay. Andy, you're frugal. frugal. You know, I'm, a, if, you know, yeah, that, that's a nice way of saying it. But in this game, <laughs> you legitimately have to pay the money to get to some spaces early so you can get points or money or whatever the case may be. I liked it. I liked the fact that there were options. It was straightforward. I know this has been around and a lot of people love it. There is a reason for it. Definitely one you mm-hmm. should check out. I know it's part of a book series of some sort. Mm-hmm. Didn't they right. have it's part of a, yeah, based on a book. Ken and Hull, I think there's yep. Ken Follett or something. Yep. Yes, that's right. And then they have a whole, um, I know there's another one, uh, Column of Fire, which I will be talking about mm-hmm. later on. Um, and another podcast, which is a newer one, but there's one in the middle that I have not played yet. But there are there's a series of them, so I'm kind of working my way through it. I'm late, I know, but I'm getting there, and it's on my shelf staple because, well, it should be on your shelf. I'm listening to other people, <laughs> so that's Pillars of the Earth. That's cool, and and I I appreciate Mandy that you're saying that this is a an older game that you've recently discovered. And I think that that's one of our main motivations in even having Shelf Staple as a segment is as podcasters, it's so easy as gamers, as cult of the new game. I love new games. It's so easy to get swept up in the new hotness, constantly looking at new games only and forgetting about games that have been around for a few years that just because they're older doesn't mean they're not great. And as the hobby grows and expands and newer players start, we hear and talk to people who have been playing games for just six months, a year. They're really relatively new to the hobby board game world. And games like Mission Red Planet or Pillars of the Earth that are kind of like, oh yeah, that one to some players. Right. To them, it's new and exciting. And I think... I, I love that we do this. I love highlighting, and it brings me back to it, it forces me to step away from my tendency to glom onto the new hotness and remind myself of the games that are on my shelf that I still love, even though they're more than two years old. <laughs> so I'm glad you discovered a new game that go, has been around. That's awesome. Yeah. So I'm happy to do it. And that brings up a very good point with a lot of the newer uh, people to the hobby. We, and this is why this segment is so important. We are running just a little bit longer on the episode than we'd hope. So let's knock out a few quick Q&A questions and see what we can get through. And then we'll have to maybe table some extra questions for later. How's that sound? Sounds good. Q&A. I just wanted to say thank you to everybody out there that's been emailing us. I have to admit, I've fallen a bit behind on my Dice Tower email. It's been really busy, you know, convention season. But I just caught up tonight, and it's really fabulous to to read all of your emails. Some of you are giving us feedback or even constructive criticism. A lot of you are sending your own anecdotes or thoughts on topics that we've discussed on the show. And I so deeply appreciate having you engage with us and let us know what you're thinking. So keep those emails coming. It's awesome. Mandy, I know we're running a little bit short, so let's just do a couple questions. Yeah. Just, you know, we'll do that. Good. All right. So first up here. From Daniel S. I started to become seriously interested in board games about two years ago. So not a, not a huge amount of time mm-hmm. ago. And since then, I've been able to share great game, 
many great games with friends and families. I am the person who's primarily interested in the hobby, so I'm usually the one that ends up buying and teaching everyone how to play. And I've noticed that when I teach, I usually end up winning. Mm. When I started going to game groups, it also seemed that the person who taught the games ended up winning, although they'd often played the game before. I'm wondering if other people have noticed this trend as well. Is it commonplace? Am I teaching poorly or doing a disservice to the people I play with? My friends and family don't seem to care very much, but I'm wondering if that experience could be better for everyone. What do you think? That's funny. And I get this a lot because people are like, you're a teacher. And, you know, what? And I get asked something very similar, what my opinion would be on this. And it's kind of a thing. I don't know if it's just in our group or if you say something very similarly, but we always say if you're teaching a game, you should generally lose. Not on purpose, but because you're putting your focus on the other players versus mm. your strategy. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? So I'm not saying that Daniel is doing anything wrong. I think it's great that you're taking the initiative to learn the games, teach the games. And sometimes that happens. You also want to be involved in the game, you know, and try and do your best strategy. There's nothing wrong with that. Generally, when you're playing with newer players, not some people can pick up strategy very quickly and push forward and win the game. Most people fall into the camp of you're learning the game. So you're not really focusing on strategy. And that generally, in my opinion, is why it tends to be where the person who's teaching and is knowledgeable of the game tends to win. I know for myself, when I'm teaching a game, I try and go through the rules carefully. And then as people are playing, I never want to play for someone, but if they're not aware of something, I'm like, just so you know, you can do X, Y, Z. These are your options. And you can pick from that if you'd like. Not tell them how to do it, but you give them the option. So you're more focusing on each player and trying to guide them through the game. At that point, I myself, I'm not overly worried about strategy because I'm trying to ensure that they're understanding the game. So I generally tend to lose, but I think that happens anyway. <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> when I teach, I definitely lose a lot of the time. Uh, so I think it's just because I'm putting the focus there. Again, reiterating, it doesn't mean anything to, on you. You are also trying to enjoy the game. And by doing so, you know the game better and that can sometimes push you forward. So it really just depends on, I guess, the approach you want to take. If you want to kind of sit back and kind of focus on the other players, but then in doing so, sometimes people feel like they're not putting their best foot forward to play. Mm -hmm. I, I think it just depends on your mindset. Uh, but I think it's wonderful that you're taking the initiative to do that. So I don't know. What do you think, Suzanne? I think you make a, a lot of really good points. I think what you really, what really resonated for me is that idea of you're focusing your energy on making sure everybody's getting what you taught them. And right. so maybe that inherently means you're dividing your focus and maybe not fo you, excelling at your own strategies or thoughts. Um, I know for demoers at conventions, it's, it's kind of the spoken rule often of don't, crush i mean because think about it they've been playing the game 20 30 times they know oh, yeah. the game better than the people they're teaching they're going to right. likely naturally crush them <laughs> if they play all out and people react to losing in very different ways right ultimately daniel specifically says that his friends and family all seem to enjoy it even if they don't win and that's what matters if your group if the people you are consistently playing with enjoy themselves and have fun in the experience that's all that matters it sounds like you've got some great gaming people to play with just roll with it if you're all having fun roll with it certainly yeah. if you go to a game group and something weird happens and you're sensing some bad feelings you might want to talk about it with them or trade off teaching duties or maybe rethink that, but heck, you're having a good time. You're doing all the hard work between buying the games and teaching the games. Daniel, sounds like you got it good. Keep on rolling, brother. Exactly. And this is, I lose all the time. And guess what? I have so much fun losing. Well, not on purpose, but you get what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thanks for that one, Daniel. So now here's one. It seems to be potentially anonymous, but this one I'm going to ask you, Suzanne. Do you know you are using <laughs> asynchronous incorrectly? Let's talk about this. Oh, boy. Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> oh, this is going to be a good we one. We talked about villainous, and I was saying that the characters are asynchronous when I should have been saying they're asymmetric. I do thank you to the not zero number of people who <laughs> pointed out to me that I was using the incorrect word. I apologize if it caused confusion. Villainous does not have asynchronous play. It has asymmetric character powers. 
it's just one of those things about podcasting. When Mandy and I are talking, we're not we're not scripted. We're just talking and and you go into a verbal flub and you just end up it it just clicks in your brain and that's what it was. So I apologize. Asymmetric is when there are differences in their abilities and powers and they play out differently. Asynchronous is when they play at different times and the timing right. is different. I just wanted to <laughs> thank you. I appreciate your questions and thank you for keeping me on the up and up, everybody. <laughs> Can I just tell you, after this came up, I was doing a virtual learning course because as everyone knows, I'm a teacher and we're going into the foray of doing more virtual uh, teaching. And I kid you not, I have never seen the term asynchronous show up so often <laughs> in my reading. And then it was literally like a light bulb, like, okay, I it's feel this has come up before. <laughs> it's a curse. <laughs> there you go. So I'm glad we cleared it up. And <laughs> I'm glad it's clear for everyone. <laughs> All right, folks, I think we're going to end on that note right there. (laughs) Please continue to send in your questions. We will continue to add them to our Q&A section. Feel free to continue to correct me on the words that I use improperly. I apologize. (laughs) Next episode, episode 570, Tom and Eric will be back with a show. Now, normally we have this show (laughs) notes list where we kind of hint at each other what we're going to be talking about. And I got it. I just behind the scenes, behind the curtain here, the note in episode 570 says review (laughs) DS colon IFJA a semicolon SLF (laughs) semicolon a. I don't know what happened there. I think Tom sneezed on his keyboard. (laughs) So episode 570, Tom and Eric are going to be back. It's going to be a great episode. Yeah. Doing something. (laughs) Thank you, everybody, for joining us. It's such a treat and privilege to be able to podcast with you and talk with y'all about games. And wait, we can't leave without telling you what is potentially, no, not potentially, what is coming up. There are some changes that come in. And before you panic. Careful, careful how you word this. (laughs) I know, before you panic, there are things to make the podcast better. You might even hear some familiar voices. So just little tweaks here and there that we're going to toss in. And uh, yeah, so just keep an ear out for that and we'll gradually introduce them. And please, uh, our uh, emails are open. Uh, You can send us uh, any questions or feedback you have to our email. So mine is Mandy. That's Mandy with an I at Dicetower.com. And I am Suzanne at Dicetower.com. All right, everybody. Thank you for joining us. It's been wonderful having you here. And we will see you in episode 571. See you next time. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening. Promotional consideration has been provided by game publishers in the form of review copies of games. This podcast is sponsored by listeners like you. Thank you for your continued support. And speaking of support... The Jack Basil Memorial Fund is an organization dedicated to helping gamers in need. Learn more about the fund's mission and how you can help at jackbasil.org. The Dice Tower is produced by Tom, Suzanne, Mandy, and Eric, with assistance from Itai Perez, Derek Porter, Rob Searing, and Jeff Rademacher. Our theme is composed by Timothy Pinkham and arranged by Matt Bellier. And hosting is provided by Cool Stuff, Inc. Let us know what you think of the show by posting to the Dice Tower Guild at BoardGameGeek.com, following the Dice Tower on Twitter, or by emailing us at Dicetower at gmail.com. And don't forget to visit the other shows in the Dice Tower Network at Dicetowernetwork.com. Until next time, from all the gang at the Dice Tower, have fun gaming. All right, it's that time again. Two truths and a lie. So let's do a reveal from last episode. So I started with I love BBC Television Network, followed by I love CBC Television Network, and lastly, I love Fox Television Network. If you picked Fox as the television network, that was the lie that I love it. You are correct. I do not love the Fox Television Network. But Fox brought us 90210. 
Yeah, that's about the only good thing Fox has brought us. Oh, I'm sorry. Did that slip out? I'm so sorry. Okay. Oh, well, you're going to cause some fights on I'll the internet. I'll hear about that later, I'm sure. <laughs> that's okay, because I may take... I, I think my choice may direct some internet ire at me. And so maybe I'll take some of the heat away from you. I said, I love the Mr. Bean series. I okay. love the Monty Python series. And I love the Little Britain series. And the lie is... That I love the Monty Python series. <gasps> I bite my thumb at you. <laughs> <laughs> oh! I'm hot in your general direction. So here's the thing, right? Here's the thing. Holy Grail is amazing. That is a classic for a reason. Totally quotable. Totally hilarious. Watch it quite frequently. Great. And there are classic, amazing comedy bits that came from the Monty Python series, like the Department of of unusual walks and all those other things or the parrot and all but if you watch like I bought the box set of every, of the whole darn series I, I'm like oh real, there's just there's a lot of misses as with any kind That's of comedy true. show or sketch comedy show we remember the iconic ones but there's a lot of other ones that you forget about because they just weren't so great Oh, yeah, you've definitely taken the heat for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> love so, it. <laughs> I, I definitely love a lot of things that Monty Python did, but the whole series, mm, I would... Mm. Anyway, Mandy, <laughs> that's, that's fair. what's new for you this week? <laughs> so, the new ones for this week, I like science fiction books. I like horror books. I like true true crime books. What about you, Suzanne? Well, what a co-winky dink. My two truths and a lie are... I like science fiction books, I like horror books, and I like true crime books. Woo, threw you all for a loop there, so good luck. This episode is sponsored by USAopoly. From USAopoly is Tapple, fast word fun for everyone. Get ready to experience Tapple, an award-winning, fast-paced word game that gives families and friends a rush of excitement as they compete to beat the timer. Pick a category and get to thinking of words that fit the remaining letters around the Tapple wheel. But don't take too long to answer or you'll be out of that round. Be the last person standing to Tapple victory. Lots of fun for families and adults of all ages. Available at your favorite local game store today. 